a man named Simon, who was a fisherman. The name Simon means, uh, comes from a word in Hebrew that means listen. So Hebrew Aramaic meaning would be listen. And I think that's kind of uh, interesting for Simon because it seems like Simon sometimes didn't listen as well as he should. Uh, the classical Greek meaning of the word Simon was flat-nosed. So we're going to go with listen instead of flat-nosed since he was Hebrew and, and mostly spoke Aramaic. Sometimes we don't reflect our name. My name is Gregory. Uh, I don't know why I am named Gregory. I don't know. My mom's probably not watching this live stream. I think they went to church this morning. If not, mom, you can text me and tell me why you named me Gregory. I have no idea why she named me Gregory. Um, Gregory is from a word, gegereo, which means to be watchful and means you're paying attention. And I am sure there are many times in my life that my mom looked at me and said, if your name means that you're supposed to be paying attention, you are definitely unlike your name. And so a lot of times I feel like I'm kind of like Simon. Simon is supposed to be hearing, but it seems like sometimes he is not. And what we're kind of talking about in this kind of section of sermons is, is the way that, that Jesus molds Peter. And, and I, I, I take a lot of comfort from this because I can look in my life and I can see how God is molding me. And it doesn't always work out maybe the way that... Uh, that I envision it, uh, sometimes I wonder if it even works out the way that God envisions it. Sometimes I wonder if God just looks down and he looks at me and he's just shaking his head thinking, Greg, I don't know how many times I can try to tell you the same thing, but you're just not getting it. And I feel in a lot of ways that's exactly where Peter was. Peter would have these moments where he had incredible faith. And then he would do something that would make you think, "Why? what are you doing? So he steps out in faith. Uh, then he, he displays a lack of faith. It looks like he understands exactly what Jesus is talking about. And then he, he asks a question that, that leads you to believe he wasn't even paying attention. And as we go through this, I want you to kind of understand the thesis, okay? Here's the thesis. If you wonder where we're going in the next couple of weeks with this, and we'll get into... Peter taking a stand next week. We'll get into Peter not understanding the resurrection the week after that, which is Easter. But, but here's kind of the thesis I'm hoping you grab hold of. Don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged. When you think that things aren't sinking in or you, you make mistakes or uh, you, you're disappointed in yourself or you, you do something and you think, well, why in the world did I do that? Or why didn't I trust in God more? Or why didn't I listen more? Understand that you are on a journey, and sometimes that, that journey, you just need time to develop. You need, you need time to practice. You need time to put the things that you know into practice so that, that you learn how to do something. Uh, when you're getting ready to learn something new, do you immediately learn it? I mean, some of you might. I am not like that. If I want to learn something new, it takes time to learn a skill. And, and becoming a, a, a godly person and living in a way that reflects the nature of Christ, although God gives us these in, incredible abilities to do it, sometimes we're just kind of a work in progress. And that's what we're looking at with Peter this morning. I want to go through some instances in the life of Peter. I, I think I placed these in chronological order, and, and I did that for a reason. I hope they're in chronological order. If they're not, uh, we can talk about that later, but... For right now, we're, we're going to say that they are. John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verses 48 through 69, and we're not going to read that, that, entire, uh, we're not going to read that in, entire section. That is a really difficult section in the teaching of Jesus. I, we just, uh, Shaw and his communion thoughts actually just uh, kind of in, in, in not really alluded to it, but, but when he talks through John chapter 6, he's talking about being the, the bread of life. And that's a really difficult teaching, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. Okay, and, and I don't want to get into all the, the, the theology of that right now. I just want you to know this morning that what Jesus is talking about in John chapter 6 is a really, really difficult Hard to understand. If you were listening to Jesus teach that, you would have been shaking your head thinking, what in the world is he trying to say? Now, it could have been that, that in that he's alluding to communion, which is coming later, to, to eat his flesh and drink his blood, that is remembering. But more likely, 
he's, he's drawn a comparison between the Israelites in the wilderness. How did they survive? God gave them food, right? What kind of food did he give them? He gave them manna. And, and then he gave them quail because they got tired of manna like, you know, boy, that's a whole different sermon, right? That'd <laughs> be right in there. It'd be just like us. God gives us one thing, we want something else. But we'll save that. So he gives them manna, and it's the bread from heaven. They say, hey, that's bread from heaven. And Jesus comes along and said, yeah, Moses gave you bread from heaven, but he gave you bread from heaven. What did you have to do every time? You had to get new bread every day, right? It was, it was kind of physical bread. It didn't really bring life. It, it, it helped you survive, but it wasn't what God intended to bring life. I am what God wants to bring life. It is, it is my body. I am the bread from heaven because I give you eternal life, not physical life. Oh, and he gave them water from the rock, right? And, and, but, but unless you drink my blood, what is it that, that my blood provides? My blood provides eternal life. So he's drawn this comparison between what's physical and what is spiritual, what is temporary and what is eternal. And in all of that, he is saying, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. And, and if you're listening to that, even now, when you hear that, how many of you hear, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you're like, yeah. Because that's me. Uh, No, I don't think so. No. And so they're listening to this, and the Jewish leaders are listening to it, and the disciples are listening to it, and those following Jesus are listening to it, and they're they're grumbling, and they're saying, well, what in the world is he talking about, and and, and, and what do you mean? How's he going to give us his flesh to eat, and and how are we going to drink his blood? And and they grumble and saying, how does he say I'm the the bread um, that came down from heaven? I mean, we know this fella. He, He... his father's Joseph and his Mary, and we know his brothers and his sisters. What's all this stuff about? And he's teaching this lesson. And then they start disputing. And some of those hearing it said, man, that's a hard saying. Who could accept that? And Jesus talks a little bit more about it. And then we get down to chapter 6. In verse 66. And after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Listen to that. After this, after this discussion, this really difficult teaching, many of his disciples turned and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, To whom shall we go? Whoop, I messed that up. You have the words of eternal life. And we believe and we know that you are the Holy One of God. Not that they believed in in the past. They, They did believe in the past, but it makes a difference right now. We're the ones, it's Peter saying, we're the believing ones. Right? We, we believed. Now, now, Peter has believed, hasn't he? Jesus comes along and says, follow me. What does Peter do? He follows, right? He, I mean, he has made this commitment to Jesus. And he says, and, and Peter in his way is reminding Jesus of that. No, no, we believe. Some of the texts say we, we have believed, and that, that's good, too. It's hard to get this into, into English. It, the, the force here is that we did something in the past, and it's still working right now. So, so, yeah, I believed, and I still believe, and I'm continuing to believe, and it's continuing to make a, di- a difference. So I, I believe, and we know. We, we know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. Who do we go to if we don't go to you? Where would we go? Man, that is one of those statements that Peter makes. And you just, you just want to slap him on the back and say, That a boy, Peter! Way to go, man! You're getting it! Well, that makes me ask really tough questions. Not of Peter, but of me. What do you do with the difficult sayings of Jesus? Man, when Jesus comes along and gives you a really difficult teaching, a difficult statement, what do you do with that? Man, you do like the Jews and you grumble and say, well, I don't know why he's going to tell us to do that. Because some of those are really hard to accept, aren't they? I mean, Jesus has some really difficult, tough stuff. And I don't have to point all those out to the text. Most of you know what those are, about how much we love God and how much we love family and how much we love self. Sometimes easy on the ears is not always good for the soul. Do you realize that? Easy on the ears is not always good for the soul. 
I thought about this from a parenting standpoint. Sometimes as a parent, would you like to just kind of like let something go? You know, let's just not make let's just not make a deal out of that. But you know that that even though it looks pretty minor, it's one of those things that kind of shapes behavior and character. So you don't really need to let it go. But you know if you say it, it's not really, it, they're not going to want to hear it. So, so how do you balance that? Now, what I am finding is that that's also going to work the other way. There's going to be a time when I get older that my boys are going to need to tell me something and I'm not going to want to hear it, but they're going to have to say it, right? <laughs> because now what I see in that is, is I see uh, later in life I can see some role reversal going on, right? I don't know how that's going to work out exactly yet, but we'll, we'll manage that when we get there. When I get up to talk to you, should I just tell you what you want to hear? I mean, should I? You know, should I just get up here and say, you know, living a Christian life, there's really not much to it. You just coast through it, guys. You know, it, it's not really that difficult. Don't worry about making deep moral choices. Just, just kind of let them slide. You know, God will take care of that later. Or, or do you need to hear truth? Do you need to hear that sometimes you are required to make a decision that's difficult? Sometimes God is going to make you, ask you and at you're going to make a lifestyle change that, that's difficult. There are going to be times that, that you are faced with two decisions and one of them is going to be right and difficult and one of them is going to be easy and wrong and you need to stick to the right and difficult. Easy on the ears is not always good for the soul. That's why Jesus gives them these difficult teachings like this. And, you know, Timothy, when Paul writes to Timothy, uh, he says, you know, there's going to be these guys who come along and they're false teachers and, and they tell people, I love his phraseology, they're going to tell people what their itching ears want to hear. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're going to tell you what you want. And Jesus comes along and, and he asks these, these he, he makes these really difficult statements and he's making these really, uh, really tough things that he's saying. And, and, and what do we do with those? And we have to hold to those and we have to trust in those. So, when, when Jesus' message conflicts with your desire, do you follow or flee? Do you run or stay? I mean, Peter's already said, God, Jesus said, follow me, and Peter follows. So when it gets time, do you run or do you stay? You know, and some, there are some things in life that happen that, that call us to reaffirm our commitment. And that's what's happening with Peter in, in that passage. Okay, Peter made a decision to follow. Now when Jesus is giving difficult statements and a lot of people are leaving, is, is Peter going to have enough commitment to stay? When the crowd decides not to follow, will you have enough commitment to stay? Is your faith in Jesus strong enough that, that you can kind of... If, if you need to remove yourself from the majority so that you're the minority, are you able to do that when things get difficult? And, and I love this in, in Peter's life. Things got difficult, and Peter said, I know exactly where I need to be. I am not going anywhere. And, and you hear that, and you think, man, Peter is finally, it is finally clicking in Peter's mind, right? And then not long after that, after it clicks in Peter's mind, and Peter shares some of this with, with, with James and John, and some of these he shares with uh, James and John and Andrew, some of these occasions. Uh, once with the temple, tax, the temple tax, he's by himself. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't share that with anybody. That, that's just he and Jesus about the temple tax. But then the transfiguration comes along. Now, the transfiguration is, I mean, if you look in Matthew chapter 17, th this is some kind of an event. All right, I mean, this is, this is one of those spiritual events that you would probably chalk up and say, I'd, I'd like to see that. I mean, you go with Jesus up to a high mountain. Okay, now, number one, that's got to be really cool, right? Jesus comes along and says, look, I'm going to go up on a mountain and pray. I wouldn't mind if you kind of tag along and go with me. I'd be like, wow, yeah, I'm all in for that. So you go up there, and then you see the transfiguration. So Jesus is transfigured, he's changed, they look up, and there is, is Moses and Elijah. Now, if you've got to pick two guys to meet out of the Old Testament, I mean, really, they're pretty high on the list, right? So you're there, there is Jesus, Moses, 
and Elijah. And now, I am sure, at least I think, uh, I, I think Peter, I, I try to insert myself into Bible stories. Do y'all ever do that? You read a Bible story and you think, okay, I'm going to insert myself into Bible story. What would I be thinking? So if you were Peter and Jesus asked you to go up on the mountain, you get there, you look up, man, it's this bright light, and, and, and all of this stuff is going on. There's Jesus, and there's Moses, and there's Elijah, and they're all just talking. And I don't know how you know they're Moses and Elijah. I mean, I don't know if the Britannic Encyclopedia has got a picture, and, you know, Peter's been reading that. And the, I mean, how in the world do you know it's Moses and Elijah? I mean, but, but it is, and, and they recognize them. I don't know, did you carry wallet, you know, uh, the pictures in your wallet, Moses and Elijah pictures? I don't know, maybe they had trading cards. I don't, I'm sorry. I don't know if I'm on a tangent. So I don't know if they had trading cards or not. Uh, Charlie said they had monogram shirt. I don't, I don't know what they had, but he didn't know who they were. I mean, I would be like, wow, that's incredible. So Peter says, hey, Lord, it's this, man, it's good that we're up here. You know, we, we'll build three tabernacles. We'll build one for you, you know, you're understanding one for you, one for Moses, one for life. We'll build three, tra- three, we'll be three tabernacles. That sounds kind of cool, right? Sounds like the right response. Have you ever gotten in trouble and got called out? I mean, like you're, you're in class, uh, you're not paying attention. Uh, not, not any of you would do that, but, okay, me. Uh, uh, in class and you're not paying attention. And, and you're not paying attention, so the teacher asks you the question because he knows you're not listening to what he's talking about. And so, that's kind of how I feel this situation was. It's kind of like if you see somebody asleep in church, you know, and they're, they're, you know, they're kind of dozing off, they're kind of napping, and you elbow them and say, hey, man, they just ask you to pray so they jump up and pray real quick right in the middle of church. But don't do that this morning. But it's kind of one of those situations, right, where all of a sudden something happens like that. And you get in trouble. How would you like to get called down by God? I mean, like, just the voice from heaven. Just that, you know, just like the voice from heaven says, oh, you're not paying attention, are you? (laughs) How how would you like? Because that's kind of what happens in this story. What happens when he says, oh, it's good, we'll we'll build three tabernacles. Do you remember what happens? There is a voice from heaven that says, this is my son, listen to him. Oh, wait a minute, right? Is that what it says? I might have got that wrong. I don't want to, I don't want to misquote. Uh, while he was still speaking, while he was still, I mean, okay, Peter hasn't even gotten the words out of his mouth yet, right? While he was still speaking, oh, what? A bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Man, what is the voice saying? I mean, just think about that for a second. Hey, Moses and Elijah are okay, but that other guy's in a different league. (laughs) Right? He is in a different league. Why didn't Peter already know that? I mean... Why didn't Peter already, I mean, I know he knew it, right? I mean, he left everything to follow Jesus, walking on the water, done all kind of stuff, right? He's seen Jesus do all, why didn't, and I look at that story and think, I don't know why he didn't just, I don't know why he needed the voice. (laughs) And then I think, well, why do I need it? Why do I need it? Can you recognize Jesus for who he is? Or do you get so consumed with all the things that are happening in the world and all the things that everybody else is seeing and all the things that other, everybody else says is important and, and all the other things that, that everybody else says hold more significance and doing all of that stuff, can you, leave, can you lose understanding the significance of this is my son whom I am well pleased to listen to him? And it's not that the thing that Peter experienced wasn't great. It was great, right? But then we could also get in some great spiritual experience and all of a sudden win this great spiritual experience, but we forget to realize what is the most important part of the experience. Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God. Can you recognize Jesus for who he is? And Peter gets into this situation. I'm not sure he didn't recognize it, but maybe it didn't stand out just as much as it should have. So in Matthew 18, they've been walking down the road and they're arguing. 
And they're arguing just like we would argue. Hey, who's most important? And I can, I mean, can you just hear that? I can hear James and John. Well, you know, we left dad sitting in the boat, so we got to be like a lot more important because Matthew, I mean, he left a tax collector, but he was a tax collector of all things, right? Oh, we got to be the most important. And I mean, you can, I mean, you're sure that Peter's in that conversation too, right? Because Peter's not ever quiet. Now, you know, me and Andrew, you know, we were kind of the first ones. You know, when he came along, I mean, when you, I mean, at least reading the Gospels, right? When he came along and he was picking guys, I mean, we were at the beginning, so that, we must be really, really important. And so they're arguing about who's the greatest, who's the most important. And so they get where they're going, and uh, this real interesting, well, I didn't put a slide up there. They get to where they're going. And I love Jesus. Jesus says, what are y'all talking about on the road? <laughs> he knows exactly what they've been talking on the road because the text says he knew what they were talking about. So when he shows up, he just says, y'all ever do that to somebody? You know what they're talking about? So you just say, hey, what are y'all talking about? <laughs> Jesus says, what are y'all talking about? Oh, I don't think they were real excited about telling Jesus, oh, we were trying to decide who's most important, right? I don't think they're really into that. So you remember the, what happens, right? Jesus sets a little child him and says, look, lest you become like a little child. You know, the one who is most important is the one who serves. Now, I don't know where Peter's been in all this conversation, but in all of this, Jesus starts talking about, well, you forgive your brother. If your brother sins against you, you forgive him. Now, you know, arguing along the road, there's got to be some forgiveness going on somewhere, right? So the question becomes, well, how often should I forgive? And Jesus says, look, you need to forgive people. And that's where he goes through this process. If you got something to get somebody, you go see that person first. And if that doesn't work, you go with two or three witnesses. And if that doesn't work, you go to the church. And if it doesn't work going to the church, then you treat that person as you would as, as an outsider. So Peter and all of that says, okay, Lord, so, so how many times should I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Now, man, this sermon's going to go long. That's okay. Y'all just hang on. Y'all would never do that, would you? Would you ever do that? You have never asked, well, I don't know how many times I'm supposed to forgive him when he comes back and does the same thing over and over and over again. I mean, he got the same kind of behavior. He did this last week, now he's doing it again. I'm not, I'm just, I'm drawing a line. I feel like that a lot of times. So Peter, you know, you got to love it. He at least asked, right? Seven times, up to seven times. And why does Jesus reply? Jesus, as I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Now, some translations say 70 times seven. Uh, either one of them is great, right? They both got good textual support. 77 times comes more from the Hebrew text and the Aramaic text, which has 77. Uh, the, the Greek Septuagint has 70 times seven, which is, is also uh, heavily attested. And when you look at the textual evidence, you kind of scratch your head because Jesus is quoting an Old Testament thing here, and you're scratching your head thinking, well, is it 77 times or 70 times seven? It makes no difference. What is the point of 77 or 70 times seven? As many as it takes. As many as it takes. Boy, I, I just got to be honest with you. This is one of the verses I just don't like. <laughs> I just don't like the as many as it takes first. Okay, but that's what it says. So there's Peter. You think Peter's been offended? Uh, the text doesn't say that he, that he has, but, but I kind of wonder in, in, in Peter's mind if he's just not saying to Jesus, you know these guys that argue, I mean, how many times am I supposed to forgive those, Jesus? I mean, in their limit. The thing I love about Peter is Peter asked the question. Peter asked the question. How many times do you get to a situation where you really need to ask the question and you don't ask the question? He asked the question. You know, it's right after this that Jesus tells that story about the guy who owed the talents. So there was a guy who owed somebody... Uh, 10,000 talents. So uh, it, it's kind of hard to explain 10,000 talents. So we're going to do it this way. 10,000 talents is 200,000 years of whatever you make a year. So 200,000 years salary. You're not going to live long enough to make that. I, I don't think. If you live to be 200,000 in this body, I mean, I'm going to live to be 200,000, but it's going to be out of this body, right? But 200,000 years of wages. That, that's a lot of money. I don't care what you make, whatever scale you're on, that's a lot of money. And, but, and, and he goes to the master, and, and remember the master says, oh, never mind, don't, don't worry about paying that, just, just forget about it. And so he has a guy who owes him 100 days, just 100 days, 200,000 years versus 100 days. What does he do with a guy that owes him 100 days? This is an interactive sermon, y'all can talk about this. He puts him in jail. 
I tell you what, until you pay me back all of my money. So, so the master hears that, and what does he say? Well, I'm going to go back and get you and put you in jail till you pay the 200,000 years stuff. That's going to be in there a lot longer than 100 days. What's the, what's the point of the parable? Oh, yeah, I'm the guy that owes the 10,000 talents, right? I'm the 200,000-year guy. And who are you? You're the 100-day guy. If Jesus gets so clear with stuff, doesn't he? If you don't forgive your brother, Jesus is not going to forgive you. Peter goes through this life. But what I want you to see is this, this thing that's happening with Peter. Because it, it, looks, it looks just like my life. Good thing, bad thing. Good thing, bad thing. Two goods, one bad. Two bads, one good. You, you ever feel like that? And in all of this, Jesus is forming Peter to be exactly what he wants Peter to be. So in, in all of your struggle, God is forming you to be what, you, what he wants you to be if you'll just listen and go through the process. So the rich young man comes to Jesus right after this. Just follow along. This is kind of Peter's journey, right? The rich young man comes. What should I do to inherit eternal life? Ah, oh, you know the commandments. A lot, a lot. You can go all that. I've done all those since I was a kid. Jesus says, well, leave everything you have and follow me. Give it, uh, sell everything you got. Give it to the poor and follow me. And he went away sad, wanted to go away sad because he had lots of money. And Jesus says, it's hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom. Oh, you got to love Peter. You got to love Peter. Jesus says, you know what, it's hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom. So Peter says, oh, Lord, we left everything to follow you, so what's in it for us? <laughs> you got to, I mean, just pray for it on us, right? Oh, but, but, but remember, Jesus, we, we left everything. So what, what, what would there be for us? Just when you think Peter's getting it, then Peter says something like that. I have a question. What do you think Peter was looking for? What kind of answer do you think he was going to get? I mean, Jesus goes on and says, you know, anybody who's left all of this will receive a hundred times more and eternal life, right? So eternal life is where Jesus is going with it. What do you think Peter's going with it? I wonder if Peter thought Jesus was going to say, well, Peter, if you'll just hang on when we get into this thing, buddy, I'll get you a bank account. I don't know what, I don't know where Peter was going with this. Oh, no, I, Lord, I know it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom, but, but look how good we're doing because we, we left it all. So we're not rich anymore because we left it all to follow you. So we, we ought to get something, right? Now, I hope you understand the spirit this question is coming from because if you don't, I might make you mad. And I don't want to. What are you looking for? How do you want Jesus to answer that question? Well, Lord, I gave up everything to follow you. What, what do you want for that? I mean, are you looking for an answer? Well, I don't want to ever get sick. What thing going to happen? I want everything to go perfectly in my life. Well, it, it's probably not going to happen. If you'll just kind of make me trouble-free, that's well, probably not, not going to happen. If you'll just make sure I won't struggle too much, that's well, probably, probably not going to happen. <laughs> what is there going to be for you? Well, it's a really great thing, by the way. You don't have to sit there kind of sullen. You can say, yeah, this, it's a good thing, right? It's a happy, exciting kind of thing. Eternal life. That's in it for you. That is in it for you. I don't understand it. I just can't. I've told you this before standing in this pulpit. I don't understand eternal life. I do not understand living forever. I do not have anything in my life that lives forever. I've never experienced it. Never. I'm going to experience it. Okay, I, I know that it's true. I hold on to it as hope, but I have not experienced it yet. But that's what I am going to receive. Eternal life. I, I, am, I am never going to die. I, I, the physical body will die. God will resurrect it into a spiritual body. It is not going to die. I, I don't know what else to tell you. Eternal life. Can I get all confused with where Jesus is trying to lead me because I've got my heart set so much on personal desire and what I want to happen in this life that I lose sight of the big picture? And the answer to that question, that's, how, that's a rhetorical question, that is yes, you can. Because you get sidetracked. All of a sudden things that start to become most important are really not the most important. 
You know, I, I, I love this, this phrase. I don't know. I, I can't remember if I read it somewhere or I came up with it. I don't know if it's mine or somebody else's, so I'm not going to take credit for it until I, I figure it out. But the one with the biggest pile of ashes doesn't win because that's what you end up with, right? world gets burned up. What happens to all of your stuff? What, what is the only thing that, that remains? Eternal life. God. Jesus. So how do I want him to answer that question? So what is there going to be in that for us? So you get this going along, and then Jesus does this really great thing. He gets, he sees Jerusalem, and he makes this statement about Jerusalem, and uh, it's about the end of time. It's one of those questions we'd all like answered, right? You know, Jesus goes on this discourse about the end of time in, in, in Luke chapter 12. And uh, after he goes on that discourse, uh, Peter, Andrew, James and John go to him privately and they ask questions and they want to know when will when will these things happen and when will these things occur and Peter says Lord are you telling this to everybody or just to us I mean like is this kind of like a little special lesson and the point I want you to see about that is what Jesus is telling them to do is to be vigilant and ready. To be prepared. Because then he goes into the parables about, you know, you're not going to know when I'm coming. If the master of the house knew when the thief was coming, he'd have locked the door, you know. He, he would have kept him out. But you don't know when that's going to be. You remember back when I said I didn't reflect my name? Gagoreo. Gagoreo means to be watchful or vigilant, to be prepared, to always have your eyes open, to know everything that's going on around you. Obviously, I am not like my name, okay? You know which word he uses here when he says, be watchful? Gagoreo uses my name. Be watchful. Let me ask you a question. When's Jesus coming back? Today? Good, good. I know this is in jest, but y'all know why I don't drive by Dairy Queen, right? Why do you not drive by Dairy Queen? Anybody got the answer? Jesus might come today. If Jesus might come today, is ice cream going to hurt my health? Nope. So you don't drive by Dairy Queen because Jesus might come today. If Jesus comes today, it won't matter if I eat ice cream, right? Because I have perfect body. So that's what I'm going with. And you say, Greg, that's kind of crazy. In fact, it's almost a little like off the wall. Yeah, yeah, a little bit, a little bit. And I say it in jest, but not really, because can you really live your life like Jesus is coming today? Oh, I don't know what your afternoon plans are. If Jesus is coming today, how do your afternoon's plans fit in? Now, I'm not telling you not to go do whatever you're going to do this afternoon. I, I th go do it and have a great time doing it. Really enjoy it. I mean, don't let me take away your joy. But, but uh, this is all I'm asking. Where does it fit in the priorities? Where, if you're watchful and vigilant, if you're waiting for him to return, how does it fit in? Now, it, it might be a great thing to do. I'll, I'll probably watch a basketball game this afternoon. I don't know which basketball game I'll watch. I'll probably, I don't even know who's playing. Right? But it's the NCAA tournament. I, how about that Abilene Christian? Knocking off Texas last night. Church Christ School. I'll probably watch a basketball game. Let me ask you. In the big scope of things, how important is that basketball game? That's eh, not very important. It's not, I mean, honestly, it's not very important, is it? It doesn't rank way up there. Now, can I still enjoy it? Oh, absolutely. But just remember where it fits. Do you remember where we started? I don't know how to make this thing go the right direction anymore, Reggie. Uh, I don't know if I'm going up and down. Go to the last slide. Do you remember where we started? Yeah, I'm stressed out. Uh, do you remember where we started? Do you remember? Lord, where would we go? If you leave, uh, do, do you want to leave too? Oh, Lord, where would we, where would we go? Where would we go? Let me ask you, if you don't turn to Jesus, if you don't follow him, 
If you're not his disciple, where are you going to go for truth and learning and understanding? Where, where are you going to go to have your life developed to mold to the image of God? Where are you going to go when this life is over? See, we can get so frustrated going through the process. And we can give up on ourselves. And can we get upset with ourselves? And, and we can think, man, we're not really getting we're not really getting any better than we have been in the past. And and just be patient with yourself as the Holy Spirit molds you and shapes you and gives you discernment and understanding and, and helps you observe life and helps you understand the things that are important and the things that are not important. But at, but at the very end, at the very end, where will you go? Where will when this world is over? Will you be a person who, imperfect as you are, God has molded and shaped through his spirit to create in you this, this beautiful child of God who lives for, for an eternity in his presence? That, that's what I want for you. But as you make that journey, don't get frustrated. Just, just, keep, just keep going down the path till God makes you into what he needs you to be, just like he did with Peter. If you need to respond, we're going to ask you to do that while we stand and sing.